Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to do the final thoughts video for the week. Yes, every single position, position by position. I filtered down my player pool. My final thoughts on the positions will touch on the guys I like, maybe some on why I don't like them as much, and we'll get through it. So welcome to the channel if you're new here. This channel has been exploding over the last week or two of the NFL season. A little bit of the preseason. Yeah, we were grinding that. That's how you build your education for the season, get an edge. But thank you all so much to all the new subscribers. Welcome aboard. We are now past flew right past 8,000 subscribers. Looking at 10,000 subscribers, that's a huge milestone for me. So thank you all so much. By the end of the month, absolutely fantastic. I'm excited to get down into this slate. Before we do, a couple housekeeping things. Hit the subscribe button if you get any value from this. I have a feeling you will. This was my most viewed video ever last week at 7.2 thousand views. Thank you all so much. Uh, and then on Patreon, I have exclusive content. A lot is over there. My ownership and leverage show is on Friday. It's a podcast. I have projections. I have all these stat sheets over there. My game by game notes. It's a 10 page document for this week on every single game, every single play that stands out to me. My recap and usage notes, showdown tiers, a lot of stuff, uh, way too much for the price point of only $20, honestly. Um, but anyways, it's all about delivering overwhelming value. So if you're interested in that, that's linked up down below. I will be appearing on Awesomeos channel on every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 11 a.m. to chat about the NFL slate. Um, so yeah, that's all the housekeeping. Follow me on Twitter at DFS as well. I have an NFL daily fantasy course, um, very all-inclusive course, 10 hours plus of downloadables, how to build these Excel sheets. That is all on there, taking care of any people's questions uh, for DFS, really how to win money in NFL DFS for the most part. So that was a lot, I know, but we're getting into a 13-game slate after having 12 games last week. What you're seeing over my shoulder is the target offense sheet. I do this for every single sport. It was a big hit in the NBA. You also get this over on Patreon. It's just looking at pace, defense versus position numbers, the Vegas totals, all of that stuff. You can take a screenshot it over it over my shoulder. It's probably not great quality because of the way my laptop processes, but that's all that I can do for you. So uh, let's get into it. Quarterbacks, let me blow this up for everybody. Um, not too interested in terms of looking at the stats right now or any of that, but looking at my interest. So the interest, the pool has been filtered down to about like six, seven quarterbacks that I have interest in, and I'll break down them a little bit. So right now, my most interest in terms of quarterback is probably Josh Allen, 5,300. The Giants last week ranked dead last in pressure rate, and they ranked second to last in uh, pass protection, pass coverage, actually. So what you're getting is the best concoction or recipe for Josh Allen, a team that can't get to him and pressure him, and then they won't defend the pass well. So ding, 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 a guy who had a high A dot last year, the highest in the league, is now going to have time to throw the ball. A guy who loves to scramble and use his legs, 10 rushing attempts last week, twice as many as the next best quarterback in Jameis Winston, who had five, is now going to be just running free and have no pass rushers on him. This could be a very good spot for Josh Allen, who the Giants right now after one week are second worst overall defense according to PFF. It looks like a fantastic spot. A nice pairing with John Brown makes sense in tournaments. Um, and, in, and in cash games, you don't have to correlate with John Brown, but in cash games, Allen at his price point of 53 also makes a lot of sense. He's my number one uh, interest for GPPs right now. Uh, another guy that I have interest in is Jared Goff against the Rams or against the Saints. This Rams offense is just not getting owned in tournaments right now. Low ownership on all of them. Goff had the widest overall difference between his X completion percentage and completion per percentage last week, which means his expected completion percentage was a lot higher than what he actually did, which pretty much just says he has a bad game, but a lot worse than normal. Uh, 6% higher than the next closest guy. So one of his worst games of his career in terms of accuracy. We clearly don't think that's going to stand, especially in a beneficial matchup against the Saints now. I like Jared Goff a lot at 5,900. The best game environment on the slate, but it's going overlooked because everybody likes to go into the the over, uh, is everybody's right now targeting Patty Mahomes and Derek Carr from that game. Jared Goff's being unowned and it makes no sense to me. Talking about Derek Carr, 5,100 is the lowest I would go at quarterback this week, and it's fine. He grades out completely fine on his price point. We saw Gardner Minshew, Minshew, Minshew is the actual way to say it, um, uh, just chop up that Chiefs offense. But keep in mind, he did it in garbage time. Like, they were being prevent defense. They weren't really, um, motivation probably wasn't there. So if, you're, if your narrative for playing Derek Carr in cash, which I don't feel that comfortable doing, is, oh, but Gardner Minshew the third or the second did really well against the Chiefs last week. He did it in garbage time. And if you're going to leverage Derek Carr playing in garbage time and this game as the reason you want to play him in cash. And it seems a little bit risky in my opinion. Um, I think there's better ways to go in cash. The price point is obviously great. He's still a top five cash QB for me this week. He's just definitely not number one, two, or even three, maybe not even four. Um, so he did fine against them last year. Uh, as much as you weigh that in this same spot at home, he's done fine against them. The secondary for the Chiefs is going to get a lot of slack. It looked very good week one. It ranked number six overall in pass coverage. Clearly not that great last year. 
They made some adjustments. Uh, they had some additions, some additions in the draft as well. Um, so it looked good week one. The only reason that they gave up points was garbage time. And as always, your defense is going to be a lot softer in garbage time. All right, real quick, guys, I just want to tell you about Fantasy Draft. Fantasy Draft has some of the best contests, if not the best contests, when you factor out that they're rake free. Yes, they are rake free over there on Fantasy Draft. And this contest right here, their million, Hooters million that they ran last week, $100,000 to first. The payout structure is pretty good, 70K to second, 50K to third. Pretty much what you're getting here is lower maintenance and management fees. You go and you go to the stock market, whatever it might be, you get a management investor, you're going to be paying paying some kind of account fees and management fees. You do that on DraftKings at an insane rate and on FanDuel. 30% of the money that you put into DraftKings, if you put $100 in this weekend, you're paying 30 of it just in tournaments. Yes, just in rake and management fees in tournaments. Even in head-to-heads, you're going to be paying rake. It's actually ridiculous. People just don't realize it. But at the end of the day, when you sit down and figure out how much you're paying in rake, it's a lot. So Fantasy Draft has introduced Rake Free. These people are doing good things for the community. You should go and play over there. You should put money down over on Fantasy Draft. Um, They're a sponsor of this for a reason. You guys know that I do not just sponsor anybody. I don't sponsor garbage sites. I don't sponsor garbage tools. I want people and I want my name behind good things. I played on Fantasy Draft last week. It's a very good site to be playing on. There is a link down below to get into this contest. You can check it out. It is Rake Free. It is a a great payout structure overall. Get into it. It's by far better than the Millie Maker contest that um, is just awful payouts awful rake in it it's disgusting so check it out let me know what you think let's get back to the video deshaun watson is always he's the standard uh, i said it on the thursday show with lofty he's like the the ideal fantasy quarterback like obviously patrick mahomes is fantastic but then you get even more rushing upside from watson the guy just keeps getting sacked was hit the most last year was hit the most week one if he wasn't mobile he would have been sacked 10 times last week which is very or, or this yeah this past week which is very concerning his price point is high the matchup against jacksonville used to be scary two years ago or even last year jacksonville continues to lose players from that two year ago two years ago dominant defense no telvin smith their best linebacker is gone this year so overall the defense is not going to be as good as it was i think that we should be taking advantage of that while we can before people realize that this jacksonville defense is no longer top five in the league last year they finished six i think they're going to be finishing outside the top 10 not just because of their week one performance but because they've actually lost talent on that defense but people don't pay attention to defenses all that much in fantasy because they're not the sexy players right it's the offensive players that get you points that matter or at least people think. Um, D- Dak Prescott's also in a fantastic spot. Washington ranked third worst in terms of pressure rate, 15th, right at around middle of the pack in terms of their pass coverage. So you're getting a guy in Dak Prescott who has a top five line in pass protection from last year in this year, week one, top five. And they're going to go up against a team that has no pass rush. There's also... Um, Now, no Jonathan Abram going to be coming, the defensive tackle, best guy there, and no guy going to be coming after Dak there. So a lot worse pass rush overall. They couldn't stop the run last week. Bottom five in that category with Zeke going to be out there, maybe limited, but either way, um, a five-point favorite for Dak here uh, on the road, which is a nice spot to be targeting QBs in terms of the spread. It's it's close enough that I like it. It's paying up a little bit. Like, I prefer Goff at 59. I probably prefer Allen and maybe Carr. I'm not sure yet, Uh, but Dak Prescott's in a very good spot this week with loads of weapons. Patrick Mahomes, hard not to like. If you can afford it, it makes sense. I probably don't get there in cash. I like to prioritize cheaper quarterbacks so I can get to better skills players. But in tournaments, if you're game stacking, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very good game to target. I personally will be coming in lighter on Patrick Mahomes and everybody else just because uh, than everybody else, just because of the price point. I think there's a lot viable, uh, other viable QBs like Josh Allen for 2,300 less that I have projected for over 20 fantasy points right now compared to Patrick Mahomes, who I have projected as the highest projected quarterback, but there's also a $2,000 price difference. Ben Roethlisberger is a sneaky play this week. It's the absolute best betting scenario if you're talking about like sports bettors. I don't sports bet. I don't think there's much upside. If you're somebody who's watching this and is going, ah, no, I sports bet and I win all the time. You're a liar. No, you don't. There's only like 100 profitable sports bettors ever is apparently what I've read in three separate books. Not me just saying that from actual professionals who read it, uh, wrote those books. So yeah, Big Ben, ideal sports betting spot. Ideal, which means it's also going to be good for fantasy. San, uh, Seattle just got shredded by the new Zach Taylor offense in Cincinnati, which I do think that offense is going to be a lot better. It's not Marvin Lewis anymore out there. And now Big Ben is going to get to come home after getting smacked, and uh, their offense is going to get a new fresh start against what seems like a weak secondary. $5,800 for Big Ben is a very sneaky and good price point for GPPs. Even in cash, I think it's viable as well. Jimmy G stands out a little bit, not too much. 
Drew Brees on the opposite side of that Rams game stands out. Uh, and then Tom Brady is going to stand out. He's probably a yes. Um, just, just team, the widespread usually factors and favors running backs. If you look at it throughout history, if you look at fantasy scoring for DraftKings, widespreads are not good for quarterbacks. It means that they're not going to have as many pass attempts in the second half. Maybe they get you like 15 to 18 points in the first half in a good first half, but then it's a lot of running in the second half. If anybody was to be against that trend, it would be Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and the Patriots. Last week, they were blowing out the Steelers. Tom Brady was still throwing the ball in the fourth quarter. But also Tom Brady, 72% of his pass attempts last week to Julian Edelman, James White, and Rex Burkhead. So the running backs and slot receivers. Not a lot has changed on this offense, although they have Josh Gordon out there, although they just got Antonio Brown. It's still going to be the short to intermediate passes, the technician type offense that Tom Brady, uh, for the most part, has ran like the last five to six years in New England. He's a fine play this week. He's going to grade out really good in projection systems. It's just a matter of do you want to pay that much for a guy who might actually just be handing the ball off in the third or fourth quarter to Sony Michelle a lot. I personally don't think he will be. Uh, this is a team that doesn't uh, that likes to keep their foot on the, the pedal and on the, the gas and just kind of use all the schemes they've been practicing with. Bill Belichick doesn't care what the scoreboard looks like. Moving on, moving on, moving on to running backs. And if I don't name a guy that you have interest in, it just means I don't have interest in him right now. Um, for one reason or another, there's reason why to every single one of them. You can watch the awesome show, uh, two hour show or so about every single player we pretty much go through and why we have interest or not. Um, but there's reasons why it's not me just overlooking something. So if you do want to get into the mentions, if you do want to get into the YouTube comments and say, this guy knows nothing, he didn't say anything about Aaron Rodgers. There's a reason why I said something about him in other spots, my game by game notes, whoops, my game by game notes on Patreon. I talk about pretty much every single quarterback spot. Um, so just know that I can't have a three hour show here or else nobody would watch it. Running backs, we'll go through them quickly. Barkley's going to be low owned. He's a very good tournament play. Um, Le'Veon Bell had like over like 23 fantasy points last week against the Bills. Saquon Barkley's built very similar to Bell. Bell ran a ton of snaps. Uh, Lofty was the guy who mentioned this. 46 routes or ran a lot of routes. 46 routes last week was the highest of any running back um, and almost was the highest on the slate. Uh, Allen Robinson ran the most, I think at 52 is what uh, Lofty said on Osimo. Alvin Kamara, clear smash play. He's the best payup running back, in my opinion, based on the price point. Ownership will be high, but he's fantastic for cash, fantastic for anything uh, in terms of GPP. Austin Akivar, he got bumped up a lot for me. Hunter Henry gone. And, and this is the thing. This Chargers offense wants to play in the short to intermediate zone. The short passes to Hunter Henry, Keenan Allen in the slot, Austin Eckler in the backfield because their offensive line stinks. You want to know why Mike Williams didn't do good last week? Not just because he got injured during the game. You want to know why the other guys on the outside, Travis Benjamin, when he was on the field, didn't do much? Because there's no time for him to get into progressions and look deep. So Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, and Eckler had all the success week one, and I imagine that to continue. Now you have no Hunter Henry. Now you probably have no Mike Williams. So Keenan Allen shoots up a lot for me. And Austin Eckler definitely shoots up a lot. He's averaged 17 and a half touches in the four games. So last week and then three games last year without Melvin Gordon. I think that's only going to continue to rise now that you have no Hunter Henry out there and probably no Mike Williams. He's going to be the second read, if not the first read behind Keenan Allen in this offense. Mark Ingram, a huge favorite here is the Baltimore Ravens. I do like Mark Ingram. No pass catching upside, but at $6,000, he grades out very well. 14 overall red zone touches last week. For this Baltimore offense, he had five, but he got pulled in the fourth quarter, so he probably would have had seven or eight. Gus Edwards had seven. Justice Hill, the rookie, had two. Um, he was first in points per snap. This is a very good stat from Pro Football Focus. 0.91 points per snap. So when he was on the field, he was so efficient, and we expect that a lot more in an offense that wants to run the ball one. Uh, and number two, uh, they want to rely on their new acquisition in Mark Ingram, as shown in week one. Derrick Henry is very similar to Mark Ingram. Same price point, $6,000. Both these guys aren't going to catch the ball a lot, if at all. Both these guys are going to be out there um, just running and getting a lot of touches in their, when their team's ahead. You have to pick your spots with Derrick Henry. Last week, in hindsight, didn't seem like a good one. He catches a 75-yard touchdown. That doesn't happen every week. He did run 10 routes last week, which is something that also doesn't happen every week. So it's good to see his um, him running routes and being active, at least in that receiving game. We'll see if that holds true. But he's in a favorable spot. He's a, he's a favorite here. A home favorite, I believe. And that's the best spot to be targeting running backs, especially ones that can't catch the ball because the game script lines up to being either neutral so they can still be running if they're down by three or they're leading in the game. And then there's makes sense to be running for their offense. So an offense that wants to be built around Derrick Henry, both him and Ingram stand out to me. Devin Singletary, fantastic play. $4,200 for GPPs. 4,200. Lafayette on our show discovered a fantastic um, stat 
which was, look, that, he touched the ball nine times and had 98 yards. He only was used in the second half pretty much. He had 94 of his 98 yards in the second half. He had eight of his 10 looks in the second half. They realized, hmm, we're down 16 nothing. Let's actually start using this guy, Devin Singletary. Absolute monster last week on a per-touch basis, over 10 yards per touch, almost 11 yards per touch, 10.9. Looked fantastic. He had 70% of the snaps. So for all the people in my mentions about, ah, but Frank Gore before the season started, no, Frank Gore had 11 carries to close out the game um, on just drives where you needed to get somebody to cross the line because you should have him in there. The veteran that you trust over the rookie in terms of ball security. But 71%, 71.4% of the snaps for Devin Singletary at 4,200. With that much work in the second half, I would not be surprised to see an explosion game um, for a guy who is favored at home at the running back position against a very bad Giants defense. And also the Giants defense second lowest pressure rate. So you don't have to worry about Devin Singletary not being on the field because of pass protection purposes instead of Frank Gore being there because the Giants stunk at actually getting to the passer. Josh Jacobs, very interesting. I'm torn on him in GPPs and in cash. Look, the price point is fantastic. If he would have done what he did on Sunday and not Monday night when the salaries already came out, maybe he would be like $6,000. 4,700 is tough. This is what it comes down to. Do you think that Josh Jacobs is a guy who is going to see um, the pass catching work? Or is Jalen Richard, who only had 16% of the snaps last week, going to come through and see more of the work? Because if it's Josh Jacobs seeing the pass catching work, great player. If they get down 14 to 3, 4,700 is obviously a great price point. But if it's Jalen Richard stepping on the field more, and they have said that they want Jacobs to be the three down back, but who knows once you're down by two touchdowns, if that's the case, they're seven and a half point underdogs in this one. Josh Jacobs, if he comes off the field for a lot of the time, um, that's not great, right? Obviously, that's not great. He was he was a benefit of he benefited from his team being up seven nothing and fourteen nothing the entire first half. The best possible game script for a running back. He was a decent pass catcher in college, but not heavily utilized. He came out of of the college in the draft with remarks saying that he was a good pass catcher, but in very small samples. So who knows? Jalen Richard's an elite pass catcher. It's just a matter of does John Gruden use him? He was reluctant to use him last year in obvious spots to use him. So maybe this is a spot where Josh Jacobs stays on the field, whether they're down 13 or not. That's just the issue. He's going to be like 40% owned. He's coming in right now for GPP ownership. That's really high. I get it. He's cheap, but he's also a huge underdog with a role that we don't know if he's going to be used in the pass catching game. So keep an eye on that. I think he might be risky in cash, believe it or not, at 4,700. He's fine though. Like he'll probably see 15 touches. It's just a matter of if he goes 15 for... 55 yards. Is that doing anything for you? No. And if you tell me though, he's going to be used in the receiving game. Well, then yeah, he's an absolute smash play. That's up for you to decide. We haven't seen it yet. We don't have a sample in the NFL of them being behind big and needing Josh Jacobs to catch the ball. We don't, but we do know Jalen Richard's back there and he's a very elite pass catching back. So keep that in mind. Tariq Cohen is interesting, mainly because of the fact that he was using the slot. Anthony Miller is going to be more healthy now and probably take away from Cohen's role in the slot. So somewhat interesting just because of that usage is elite for a running back being used as a wide receiver at only 4,500. Zeke is going to be interesting because Washington stunk last week, but there are reports that Zeke is still going to be limited, which is worrisome. Obviously at 8,700, I'd rather just get to Saquon and Kamara and not take the risk. Chris Carson, 6,400, led the team in touches overall, led the team in snap, um, led the running backs in snaps. Uh, in carries and in targets, seven targets, 37.5% of the target share uh, for Chris Carson. He's fine here. It's it's obviously not the greatest spot on the road as an underdog, but he does have pass catching work that helps. Sony Michelle, look, it's a huge favor. This is a spot you usually want to get to Sony Michelle, but still a three-headed monster back there. Rex Burkhead, James White, the Patriots know that being efficient means throwing short to your running backs. That's what they did week one even in a blowout. Sony Michelle looked terrible week one, but this is definitely a spot to see Michelle just erupting. So if you like him, sure, get to it. Just know you're not getting pass catching upside there. David Johnson is game flow independent now for me. He lined up 15 times as a wide receiver, only lined up 16 times all season as a wide receiver last year. So lots of upside in him at 7,100. Todd Gurley, 7,000. I still like him for GPPs. He had a good week. People are saying that he didn't have a good week last week. 15 touches for 101 yards on 70% of the snaps is good. This is the piece you have to look at. Malcolm Brown was on the field for 28% of the snaps. He did not take Todd Gurley's red zone work. That's what people are, are ignorantly saying. He was on the field for those drives, and Todd Gurley was never spelled for Malcolm Brown. Malcolm Brown scored those touchdowns because those were his drives. Todd Gurley never came off the field for Malcolm Brown to go in. So um, that is just all hearsay on people being very ignorant right now. But Todd Gurley is a guy who was on the field for 70% of the snaps, saw 15 touches. Only guy to see a target in the receiving game. Somewhat concerned, uh, somewhat encouraging, just not a lot of work there. Malcolm Brown was on the field for 28% of the snaps and saw 11 targets or 11 touches on the ground. The question you have to ask yourself is, were those purposely given to Malcolm Brown on those drives or was that just the way that the game flow set up? Like if you're going to get 28% of the snaps for Brown and that's just the way that it folded out, they weren't purposely scheming to give Brown those carries, um, 
more so in those drives than Gurley on his drives. Well, then more times than not, if it wasn't on purpose, you're going to see in that situation a 70-30 split or 28% split for Brown. You're going to see like six touches, not 11 for Malcolm Brown more times than not. Todd Gurley, I think you saw his floor in week one, to be honest with you. I think he's going to be getting 18 touches and he's in a very good game environment. People keep overlooking him. People keep saying that he's bad. He had 15 touches for 101 yards week one. What are people thinking? He ran on 70% of the snaps, which is not normal to his normal 80 to 85%. But if he's going to get 18 touches this week in the best overall game environment, um, why are people just shutting him down like he stinks? And also he's $7,000. This is the lowest price point you might see on Todd Gurley ever again. Yes, ever again. So uh, crazy to me that people are just wiping him off like he's completely washed. He had a very good effective week one based on his touches. Adrian Peterson, 3,400. No Darius Geis. He's going to be done. He's getting a second opinion. Likely out six to eight weeks was the first report. Adrian Peterson's going to step in. He's a home underdog at 3,400. He's interesting for me in cash because if he gets you eight points, that's fine at 3,400 in cash, honestly. It lets you get to a lot of things. In GPPs, though, do you really think AP has tournament winning upside? He has to go for like 110 and a touchdown, get you 20 fantasy points or so. I think it's he has that ability, right? Dallas, after week one, ranks second worst in rush, de- uh, rush defense per, per, per football focus. Um, but Adrian Peterson, 3,400, this is the most interesting spot on the slate. Yes, the most interesting spot on the slate is Adrian Peterson, $3,400. Uh, can he get you in the end zone? If he gets in the end zone, he's fantastic for cash. If he doesn't and he goes 17 carries, and they're underdogs here, so keep that in mind, and Chris Thompson is going to be on the field in every single pass situation, which doesn't set up well for Adrian Peterson, but if he gets like 17 carries for like 50 yards and a touchdown, that's a smash in cash, uh, but if he gets 17 carries for like 55 yards and no touchdown, that's obviously not great, so it's up to you. What do you think his overall usage will be? It's clearly only going to be on the ground, not in the receiving game. It's just a matter of does Adrian Peterson have it in him. Dallas's defense was not great week one against the run. Um, and then overall, Adrian Peterson should have a lot more motivation after being a scratch last week, just healthy scratch. They didn't dress him, which is kind of a slap in the face, in my opinion. Uh, that's it. I know there's other running backs down here for net, Mal- uh, Marlon, Mack, carry on Dalvin Cook that people want to see my takes on. You can read the notes there. Um, but overall, they're going to be in the game by game notes on Patreon, uh, as well as in some of the podcasts that we talk about. Wide receiver is always the deepest position for me to talk about. This is the most stacked wide receiver position I've seen in a while based on pricing, based on tiers. It's crazy. Um, I'll get down into it. We'll try and make it somewhat brief. So this isn't an hour video. Michael Thomas, clear, amazing play. There's not much to say there. He's going to be the clear target. 13 targets week one from Drew Brees. Devontae Adams has absolutely murked Xavier Rhodes the last two years. In the last four games, so the last two years, 16.75 fantasy points per game for Adams against um, Xavier Rhodes. And he has four touchdowns, a touchdown in each of the last four games. He works this guy. Xavier Rhodes is only getting older and worse. If you think Xavier Rhodes is still a top cornerback, I really don't think he is. Um, last year, he finished outside the top 100 in PFF rating, and Devontae Adams just schools this boy. So Adams is in a range that is very hard to get to Adams. Like Michael Thomas is fantastic. We're going to get to Allen and Juju in a second, but Adams is still a fantastic tournament play if he comes in at low ownership. Keenan Allen's a fantastic play as well. If no Michael Williams, which I'm suspecting, if no Hunter Henry, there's just going to be more targets for Keenan Allen. He is so elite in the slot, and this Detroit team just got slashed last week by Larry Fitzgerald, a very old slot wide receiver who's still pretty good, obviously good, um, and Christian Kirk slashed them. Didn't come out with a good stat line, but uh, Murray, Kyler Murray just missed him on two passes that would have ended Christian Kirk's day with like 100 yards and one to two touchdowns. So yeah, Keenan Allen's an elite wide receiver, especially when using the slot. That's where he'll be this week. Even if Darius Slay follows him, I do not care. There's going to be so many targets going Keenan Allen's way. Juju against Seattle. Seattle got wrecked last week, um, whether it was John Ross, whether it was Tyler Boyd being very efficient in his role. Uh, This week, as long as Juju's okay, he's day-to-day right now. He's in a great spot at 7,500, too cheap, likely sees double-digit targets, likely catches. um, I have him projected right now as being the third best wide receiver in pure points, and he's priced as the fourth best guy. So it stands out, but third best is very close even to Michael Thomas, who's the highest priced guy. So Juju is probably about $500 too cheap, in my opinion. Yes, $500. Amari Cooper will not be shadowed by Josh Norman, as some people usually suspect he will. He was not shadowed last year by him. Still in a good spot. We talked about Dak going to have a lot of time to throw due to his offensive line, due to the bad pressure that Washington He's not going to be able to force on Dallas's line. That just helps Amari Cooper overall. Not going to be shadowed. I think he's fine. Sammy Watkins is too cheap, 7,200. I'm not going to chase points. Like I don't don't think we're point chasing here. He is the number one wide receiver now in the best offense in football with the best quarterback in football in a very good spot. And he's only 7,200. He should be $1,000 more. 
Julian Edelman saw 11 targets last week. Even if Antonio Brown comes back, Brady still just throws to the slot and wide receivers or in running backs, right? Again, 72% of his attempts last week were to running backs and Julian Edelman. So Edelman still has upside here. 6,900, I'd rather get to guys below him though, but there's still interest. These are the guys who stand out to me right now. This range right here of 64 to like 6,000. All three wide receivers for the Rams. I rank it Cooper Cup. In cash, I rank it Cooper Cup, Woods, and Cooks. In tournaments, I rank it Cooper Cup, Cooks and Woods. They're all in fantastic spots. Cup is going to get to see um, PJ Williams in the slot. At least last week, that's how they lined it up. The Saints, PJ Williams was guarding the slot. Uh, cor- uh, corner wide receiver, sorry. Uh, and Cup has about 20 pounds on PJ Williams. That's an advantage. Cup was top 10 last week and top 10 all of last year in separation at the wide receiver position. So now when you factor in, he has 20 pounds on him. That's a lot easier to get separation. And we talked about it. Jared Goff had a really bad game last week. One of the worst, if not the worst in his NFL career in terms of just completion percentage versus expected completion percentage. I don't expect that to hold. I don't expect him to go back to back worst games. That's going to help Cup, a guy who should have separation. And as long as Jared Goff should increase his completion percentage, will be helping Cup a lot. As well as Brandon Cooks probably had the worst game last week due to Cup, due to um, Jared Goff just throwing the ball over his head twice on deep routes, once in the middle of the field, missing him. Brandon Cooks probably should add two to three more catches for at least 50 more yards if uh, Jared Goff was just his normal self. And then Robert Woods, 13 targets, Mr. Reliable himself. Nothing to say bad there. Allen Robinson, I have a very strong take on. I think he's a fantastic wide receiver. I think he's going to have a fantastic week. He's got about 21 to 22 pounds on Chris Harris Jr., who will probably be on him the most. Matt Nagy schemed Allen Robinson into the slot 45% of the time last week in motion because the slot is the best spot to have wide receivers in. It's as simple as that. So Allen Robinson is going to be schemed into the slot. This Bears offense was as bad as it's going to get. Trey Burton should be coming back. Anthony Miller will be getting more healthy. Tariq Cohen another week working as a wide receiver. Um, It's going to get better. Like people are going to overreact to it because week one, everybody overreacts. It's going to get better. And if you're telling me that Allen Robinson had the best performance, like over 100 yards uh, last week was targeted 13 times in the week where Mitch Trubisky had his worst week probably of the season when it's all said and done. Yeah, give me Allen Robinson at 6,100. Uh, I don't care about the matchup. He's got 20 plus pounds uh, on Chris Harris. And if he follows him into the slot, he's just going to dominate him. John Brown Jr. Uh, or John Brown um, for Buffalo. Fantastic spot. Pair him with, you can play him in cash. I'd rather play him only in tournaments because he's a high A dot guy, averages up the target. Just not much to say. It's a fantastic spot. Tyrell Williams, I'm not playing him in cash. He does not have upside to me in terms of a floor, right? Like he's a high A dot guy, averaged up the target. I think you're playing him in cash. It's very similar to Curtis Samuel last week, who was 4,200. Everybody wanted him in cash and he fell on his face because he's a high A dot guy. And also Cam Newton was inaccurate. Um, But Tyrell Williams, a fantastic tournament play. Terry McLaurin, the best wide receiver under 4,000 by a mile. I don't know how he's priced below Trey Quinn. I don't know how he's priced below Paul Richardson for this week. Fantastic play. By far the best 4K wide receiver on the slate. I don't think you have to get to him, but if you are digging down there, that's where you go. And then my maybe interests, Tyler Boyd looked fantastic last week. Fantastic cash play, eight catches for like 60 yards. That's like his floor, right? He is the Robert Woods of this new Zach Taylor offense. If you don't know who Zach Taylor is, he's the coach for the Bengals. He's the former wide receiver coach in 2017 for the Rams, Sean McVay, and 2018, the quarterback coach. Now he's the head coach and he made John Ross look like Brandon Cooks. That's the role that he played. And he made um, Tyler Boyd look like Robert Woods. That's the role that he was in in this offense. And he looked very good. I like Tyler Boyd a lot. Michael Gallup's fine. D.D. Westbrook's going to get to go up against Houston, who just cut Aaron Colvin. So the slot is now wide open. And now D.D. Westbrook is an elite receiver who saw a 24% target share from Gardner Minshew when he came in. Six targets. DeAndre Hopkins absolutely does fine against Jalen Ramsey. He's the best wide receiver in the league, DeAndre Hopkins, in my opinion. Has had at least 14 fantasy points per game in each of the last five matchups, so two and a half years. Last year, he went for a buck, like 27 on 12 catches on Ramsey. He had a touchdown the game before that. He had a touchdown in each of their two matchups in 2017. So he's fine. Like, if you want to pay up for him, I'm not going to tell you not to. I don't think that you fade DeAndre Hopkins this week just because of the matchup, because he's been very good in this matchup for the last two and a half years, because he's absolutely elite. McCole Hardman is interesting. 4,800 will be filling in for Tyree Kill. They said that they're going to work the playbook around Hardman's skill set because it wasn't in that order last week. That's why Hardman didn't do much. So that's encouraging. Good play at 4,800. Tyler Lockett, 6,200 is a fine play, but he's dealing with a back injury. So monitor that. Debo Samuel for the 49ers. I probably only get to George Kittle here. Don't have much interest in the running backs either either at that point. Um, So Debo Samuel ran the most routes, 3,700, probably the second best play in that range behind Terry McLaurin. John Ross, I have interest still because again, he was in the Brandon Cooks role. This is a new offense with a new coordinator. It's not dusty old Marvin Lewis's team anymore. So I have interest there as well. Larry Fitz, Christian Kirk are outside plays for me uh, in terms of wide receiver threes or flexes that I think have upside because the Ravens secondary is very injured. 
They lost Jimmy Smith. They lost another. They lost two cornerbacks, and Marlon Humphreys is also dealing with an injury. So it's a lot worse than it seems in Baltimore in their secondary. Their defense is good when healthy, uh, but I think a guy like Christian Kirk, who would have had a big day last week if uh, Murray was just efficient and accurate, uh, he's going to be in the slot. He should be getting a lot of work. And also, he should have some upside. Now, I don't think it's a fantastic play on Kirk, but I do think if there's going to be a lot of guys injured and Murray's going to be targeting the slot a lot, that Larry Fitch still has upside, and Christian Kirk probably comes in very low-owned as a tournament dart throw. Tight ends, um, very, very good value at tight end this week. Travis Kelsey, 7,300. Fantastic play if you want to pay up for him. Nothing bad to say. George Kittle, uh, Cincinnati improved on their pass rush um, and on their run stop, but they were still bad. Bottom third of the league came in like 21st or 22nd last week against the pass. George Kittle had two touchdowns called back. He's also a fantastic play. If you want to pay up for it, I prefer Kelsey, but again, it's just whatever you want at that point, whichever flavor you like more. Um, Evan Ingram, 5,200. It seems like a tough matchup against Buffalo, but if he's going to have 12 plus targets in this game, especially if there's no Sterling Shepard, I first have to see somebody stop this man because when he gets at least eight targets, he finishes as, as he finishes as a top five uh, tight end in DraftKings every single time dating back to last year. He ran around on 82% of Eli's dropbacks last year, last week. He's going to have a lot of opportunity, 5,200. I don't prefer it. It's in a weird range, but if you want to get to it, I think it's fine. I'm not going to tell you not to. This is the range that is the best, the $3,000 range. Jimmy Graham, is probably the one I have the least interest in, but Rodgers threw 33% of the time to the tight end. They want to throw more to the tight end. It was good to see him see two red zone targets and catch the only touchdown of the game. Delaney Walker was on the field for only 48% of the snaps last week, but he was still in third out of every position, which is crazy. Third in fantasy points per snap. He had a team leading six targets. He ran around on 21 of his 27 snaps, and I imagine he continues to see more snaps uh, because he was injured, right? They're working him back into it. Delaney Walker also facing Indy, who gave up 60 yards on six catches to an injured for part of that game, Hunter Henry, last week, and also they gave up the most yards to tight ends the year before that last year. Darren Waller is probably the best tight end on the slate. Seven catches for 70 yards on Monday Night Football. Played 100% of the snaps, team leading eight targets. The guy's way too cheap. He's very athletic. This is an offense that last year under John Gruden made Jared Cook look like a star or at least a very good tight end. Uh, You had Derek Carr wanting to throw to the tight end position. He threw to it. He made Jared Cook look good. Darren Waller is now a better, in my opinion, more athletically gifted tight end than Jared Cook. He looked fantastic on Monday night if you saw it. If not, you know, um, you're going to soon know the name Darren Waller. Go pick him up on your waivers if you have not yet. TJ Hawkinson, the rookie against the Chargers. It's a tough matchup against the Chargers, but Hawkinson would be the only guy in Detroit I really want to get to. Um, People want to get to Danny Amendola. This is another thing. Don't. He's going to face Desmond King. It's a trap. He had 11 targets in regulation, 13 overall last week, Danny Amendola. Now he's going to face the best slot cornerback in the entire league in Desmond King. Don't get there. It's a terrible play. Can he have five catches for 40 yards and a touchdown and get you there in 15 points? Sure. But I could say that about 50 other wide receivers on this slate. People are going to want to get there. They ran 80 plays last week, the Lions, because they were facing the number one pace team in the league, the Cardinals, who said they were going to do that, and they did. Props to Cliff uh, King or to Cliffsboro. Um, but they're going to run like 65 plays this week. Uh, they're going to be a lot slower in a slow paced game. Danny Amendola is not going to have that many looks. He's not going to have that much yardage. He's not going to catch that many balls. Desmond King is elite in the slot cornerback. So don't just ignorantly play him because you saw a lot of targets. Anyways, TJ Hawkinson is my favorite Detroit player, and $3,000 is hard to ignore. Nine targets. I'm not expecting that. I'm not expecting the game he had last time. I do like that he ran around 73% of the times when he was out there, and if he sees six targets at $3,000 with his skill set coming out of college regarded to the best prospect at tight end ever, um, that's crazy. But yeah, TJ Hawkinson, 3000 is way too cheap. I like it. I prefer in the 3K range in this order, Darren Waller, uh, TJ Hawkinson, Delaney Walker, Jimmy Graham. Uh, on the slate, again, look, it's 3300 for Waller or 7300 for Kelsey. I prefer Waller there. You're saving $4,000, but I'm not going to uh, say that you're doing something bad if you do want to get to Kelsey. Mark Andrews, he was fifth overall in fantasy points per snap, number one in yards per route run for tight ends, and he ran a snap on 64% of the routes uh, or snaps that he was out there. The issue is he only played on like 42% of the snaps overall. So if you tell me, Sal, why don't you play Mark Andrews at 42% snaps, even against a bad team in Arizona with uh, Lamar Jackson, who I think is good, even before last week, I've been hyping him since the summer. Why don't you play him over Darren Waller, who saw eight targets, more um, similar targets, and was on the field for double the snaps, more than double the snaps, like two point two point one times the snaps, right? Crazy. So give me Darren Waller there. Give me TJ Hawkinson there. Mark Andrews overall, um, 3,800. I'd rather not get there. I think that Mark Andrews is fine. I just think that regression is coming. This guy can't be that effective. The good news is he was running a lot of routes, 64%. Uh, The bad news is that was a lot less than you were getting out of TJ Hawkinson, Darren Waller, 
even like Evan Ingram and the expensive guys. I think Tyler Eifert's worth mentioning. He had he ran around on 65% of the snaps, six targets. Just keep in mind, he's 2,900. It's the only reason I'm mentioning him. Uh, and you did have Andy Dalton throw just a ridiculous amount of times, 50 plus last week. So yeah, the interest again, Darren Waller, TJ Hawkinson, Delaney Walker in the bottom range. And if you want to get to the top tight ends, you can. It's just a matter of preference there. So I know I talked a lot. I know I probably stumbled a lot because I just did a two hour show with Lofty and now I talked about this late for like a half hour. So I just have to get a lot done sadly. Well, not sadly. I just have to get a lot done and prepped um, because I'm shooting this on Thursday night instead of Friday morning because my cousin's coming really early tomorrow morning. Uh, He's coming flying into here in North Carolina and I have to be ready to kind of have one, a fun weekend with him. And that what that takes is me getting this work done before he gets here, obviously. So Appreciate you tuning in. If you got any value from this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I want to get to 10,000 by the end of the month. And if we get there sooner, it's even better. I'll be live before the game starts at 11 a.m. The games on Sunday start at 11 a.m. I'll be live tonight for Thursday. If you see this in time uh, at 6.15 for an hour. So I appreciate you tuning in. Check out Patreon if you want more exclusive content. I mean, I'm in over my head over there. I'm not. I I like doing the work, but probably about 20 to 25 hours a week goes into Patreon content. I'm delivering what I hope is a lot of value over there. So you can check that out. Check out my daily fantasy course. Follow me on Twitter at DFS. That's a lot of plugs, but I just want to make sure I get them all out there. Let me know if this was good. I love doing this. I love researching. I love sharing that knowledge with all of you. If you're getting any type of value from this, let me know. And if you want to be a jerk and drop down below and be a negative person in the comments, um, you can. If you're nice about it somewhat, I'll try and have an open discussion about where you thought I was wrong. If you're just going to be a jerk face, I'm just going to hide the comment. So you might as well just save your breath. So appreciate it. My name's Sal. You already know that. Peace out, gang. Hey, hey, hold up, hold up, hold up. One second. Check out this page. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button, all right? And if you're interested in Patreon, if you're not already a patron, you can hit that button on Patreon, become a patron. It will take you right there. You can also check me out on Twitter, at DFS. And hey, if you're interested, this next video that's about to pop up, why don't you check it out as well? See ya.